can, actually. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that um, a few of all you guys and some who aren't here actually do get messages and do hear and do take notes. And in that sense, um, your scribes, just as as Helen was a scribe, um, and and in this in this section, uh, starting on page fifty nine, Jesus talks about um, the role of scribes. Now he doesn't say Helen; he uses the term scribe. So I know he's not just talking to Helen, but he is talking to those who hear him directly and have the ability to take down the messages they receive. Now, when I receive messages, I get visions, I get told stuff, but I don't get like, you know, pages of notes. To me, that's what a scribe and how a scribe operates. They have the ability to sit there and hear the voice and write down what's given. So in that sense, that's what I understand by scribing. I have the ability to get the guidance and to hear the voice, but I'm not necessarily a scribe. Um, so when I was reading along and I got to this section, knowing how many of you all actually do get, you know, direct guidance and direct, direct material that can be scribed, I thought it was important for all you all to hear exactly what that means and you know the nature of your functions because it's in the fulfillment of our functions that we bring to a close the necessity of space and time and um, that's important to me so I'll start and it's page 59 the top it says Helen's notes he says, note, scribes have a particular role in the plan of atonement because they have the ability to experience revelations themselves and also to put it into word and to put, and also to put into words enough of the experience to serve as a basis for miracles. That's important. This is why you experience, now it gets personal. This is now he's, he's directly to Helen, but he's not just saying this merely to have Helen. He's given Helen um, an example of what he means. And I'm sure many of you who scribe will have similar, you know, understandings. So this is why you experience that revelation about I will to do very personally, but also wrote what you wrote can be useful to miracle workers other than yourself. We said before that prayer is the medium of miracles. The miracle prayer is what you wrote. If you will tell me what to do, I will do it. This prayer is the door that leads out of the desert forever. And that's important. That's important because the desert is where we experience separation and where we experience isolation and loneliness. And I understand from the nature of the ability for me to hear and get guidance that in the, when you get that guidance, it ends the isolation and separation in a way that is different from just talking to people, but in a way in which you understand the, 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 the nature of minds being joined and communication being instantaneous, spontaneous, and having nothing to do with bodies. Now, that's very important. And it's very important when you look at the entirety of the message, when you go to the fact that there is no death. Because if we could communicate without our bodies, if we could communicate without words, if we can be in communication with those who are no longer here, 
then we're experiencing life in a way that has nothing to do with the body. And the idea that there is no death begins to make sense. And then when we learn that death is a decision, we can go to the idea that we can make the decision to cooperate with the spirit when we no longer have a function here in space and time because of the fact that in space and time we fulfilled that function and now we can make the decision on our own not to die but to transition into a new light into a new way of being in a sense and i think that's important um i i, I at some point in time i want to do a, a workshop on that because there are people who i know one was an author who i publish her books and vicky frank claire now, when these people passed on, they began and continued to communicate with people here and are telling them that life is not different. You just don't have the body and you don't have, you know, there's no words being spoken, but the communication is available. And one of the things that Jesus is always saying is that communication is what life is. Communication is what life is. Non-communication is what death is because it's isolation, loneliness, and loss of vitality in that when we share life, the life is increased in us. It is amplified and in a sense multiplied. It's amplified and multiplied and it becomes a, a, a different experience than us just living alone and trying to communicate with our bodies and with words and being mistaken. You know, if we can be mistaken in that sense, then there's not communication here. And that's one of the things he says, there's no communication here because communication is of the mind. And if communication is really of the mind, then there's no one who we cannot communicate with no matter what the state they seem to live in, whether they have bodies or not. And that makes sense in terms of how the course got here and what it's here helping us to learn. So these things are some of the things that have been important to me lately. And again, it, 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 it's, it, it's newly important to me. Um, and I didn't have these thoughts until I began to hear you guys, until I began to you know read some of the stuff that you guys have sent to Vicki and also to understand the nature of people transitioning and still communicating. And certainly the ability to hear Jesus is included in that. Even though, you know, we tend to put Jesus in this higher, higher echelon of what life is, or higher echelon of, you know, value of his soul. And that's all not true. We're all of this, we're all of this, we're all the same in the sense of being souls. We may be at different levels of our, um, of our, um, what, how should I say it, of our learning. But we all learn the same way. And when we get to a certain level here, the world of space and time is no longer necessary. And this is offering us a way to learn that we don't get out by death, but we get out by cooperation and collaboration and communication. And so it's not something to fear, but it is a transition we can decide on. And he says, death is a decision. Death is a decision that we no longer, so we can decide to die because, you know, for the negative reasons, or we can decide to transition because it simply is our time. And when we reach that time, we can make that decision with the Holy Spirit not for the purpose of escaping the world, but for the purpose of evolving beyond the need for it, evolving beyond the need for bodies, evolving beyond the need for identities that seem to be separate and the things that we think we need, like food, you know, um, drink to maintain it. So, and those are important because those are the kind of things we have to learn so that there's nothing to fear. You know, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't drink and we shouldn't eat. It just means 
that while we're in these bodies, there are things that we do. And I think he, get, he gets to that in, the, in either the section before or in this section as well. Prayer is a door that leads out of the desert forever. This is not a complete statement because it does not exclude the negative. Now, this is important because he always wants us to hear it the right way. And because of the dualistic nature of our minds in space and time, we, we, we have to hear both ends, both sides, in order for it to actually fully, can, fully occupy our mind. And this is a good example. This is not a complete statement because it does not exclude the negative. We have already told you to add and not do what you would have me not do. So he says, if you would tell me what to do, I will do it. And he says, that's not enough. Add this, and I will not do and not to do what you would have me, would, would, would not have me do. So if you will tell me what to do, I will do it. And I will not and not to do what you would have me not do. So that gets very clear. It need, leaves nothing to our imagination, but completely to our choice to follow the guidance and be unmistaken about what the guidance is and the purpose that it's for. This is not a complete statement because it does not exclude the negative. We have already told you to add and not to do what you would not have me do in connection with miracles. The distinction has also been made here between miracle mindedness as a state and miracle doing as an expression. The former needs your careful protection because it is a state of miracle readiness. This is what the Bible means in the many references to hold yourself ready. Now that's very cool because a lot of times he says those and we make up what he thinks it means. But what he's really saying is hold yourself ready to be in, you know, hold yourself ready, be in miracle readiness by being miracle minded. And that happens by asking, what should I do and what should I not do? Readiness here means keep your perception right side up or valid. So you will always be ready, willing, and able. These are the essentials for listen, learn, and do. You must be ready to listen, willing to learn, and able to do. And that's what he's saying you're able, it's able to have happen. Um, because of the nature, oh my God, I lost the page. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> it turns too fast is what happens. <laughs> okay. You must be ready to listen, willing to learn, and able to do. Only the last is involuntary because it is the application of miracles which must be Christ controlled. But the other two, which are voluntary aspects of miracle mindedness, are up to you. And that shows that you're, you know, that you are listening and you are willing to learn. Therefore, you put yourself in a state of mind that is helpful both to Jesus and to our brothers here. And that's what we're aimed at. It's always this triangulation. It's always this same type of triangulation. You know, as above, so below, as within, so without. You know, so we're always able, if we're able to stay in touch that way, then we're able to be of service both to our brothers here and to um, that which is beyond space and time. Because in sense, Jesus, who is just like us, is here with us to help us bring the atonement to fulfillment. And because he has the overview, 
he has a better view of what would work to deal with the largest sort of, you know, the, the largest chain of miraculous occurrences rather than we think in terms of what would work for me. Jesus thinks in what would work in terms of the entire sonship in order to shorten the need for time in its entirety. And that's what the miracle is all about. Shortening the need for time so as to bring the atonement to fruition in the quickest way possible. Allowing everything that's meant to occur to occur and what's not meant to occur to not occur. To channelize does have a narrowing down connotation, though not in a, the sense of lack. The underlying state of mind or grace is a total commitment. Only the doing aspect involves the channel at all. This is because doing is always specific. As Jack said, a reliable instrument must measure something. <laughs> and so he's given us a way to measure the reliability of what it is we're here to do by utilizing him above for the purpose of our brothers and ourselves here in space and time. But a channel, let me move this, but a channel is also valid. It must learn to do only what it is supposed to do. So now he's talking about a, ch a channel in general. We established, you know, not not merely just a channel of, you know, uh, of, of the divine, but like, you know, we build, we, we, we build channels for specific purposes, like the pipeline. We built the pipeline in a sense as a type of channel. It's a means of transferring oil from one spot to another. A channel is also valid. It must learn to do only what it's supposed to do. And that's what, that's what he's talking about. If you're a channel and you have a function, then you must learn to do only what you need to do so we don't waste time on doing what's not needed, both for ourselves and for our brothers. So he says, change the prayer to read. If you will tell me what to do, only that will I do. Note, Helen, I object to the doggerel sound of this and regard it as very inferior poetry. Answer, it's hard to forget though. <laughs> now, see, I like the idea that we get the, we hear Helen's objections. Like we hear Helen saying, you know, Jesus, I don't really like this. And him making jokes about what she likes and doesn't like and giving us a reason for the for the way it is. It's like, yeah, this is just a friend of ours that we could talk to. He talks to us and we can talk any way we want. We can say anything we want to him. And he's not going to cut us off. He's just going to help help us understand what the hell he's trying to say for the reason that he's trying to say it. And it's always helpful. The revelation is literally unspeakable because it is an experience of unspeakable love. The word awe should be reserved only for revelations to which it is perfectly and correctly applicable. It is not appropriately applied to miracles because the state of true awe is worshipful. It implies that one of a lesser order stands before the greater one. This is the case only when a soul stands before his creator. Souls are perfect creations and should be struck with awe in the presence of the creator of perfection. Now, that's him, in a way, addressing what churches have made into him. And the fact that we should be in awe of Jesus and what he's saying is, or, or is not a state with that equals should be in of each other. Or is a state and an experience that should only be considered awesome in regards to 
going be seeing and communicating with what's beyond, you know, our own equality, you know, for, with God, with, you know, this is the case when a soul stands before his creator. Souls are perfect creations and should be struck with awe in the presence of the creator of perfection. The miracle, on the other hand, is a sign of love among equals. Equals cannot be in awe of each other because awe always implies inequality. Awe is not properly experienced even to me. Now, that's deep when you want to go to, you know, like the Catholic Church, who want to put Jesus so high above everybody here that we could never reach what he has accomplished. And what Jesus is saying is the only thing he accomplished here was the fulfillment of his function in the plan. And the only thing we need to accomplish here is the fulfillment of our function in the plan. And if as a man, he could do that, then as men and women here, we can do that as well because he's not special in any regard. He's just like us in every regard. An elder brother is entitled to respect for his greater experience and a reasonable amount of obedience for his greater wisdom. Notice he doesn't say total obedience, a reasonable amount of obedience for his greater wisdom. He is also entitled to love because he is a brother and also to devotion if he is devoted. It is only my own devotion that entitles me to yours. But you will notice that I have knelt at your altar as readily as I would even ever have you kneel at mine. Now this is some incredible statements that completely changes the nature of Jesus Christ as he's been taught to us in the past by religions. And that's what Jesus is trying to break down. He's trying to break down the false understanding to allow us to truly understand ourselves as well as him as one and the same. There is nothing about me that you cannot attain. I have nothing that does not come from God. The main difference between us as yet is that I have nothing else. Now, what he's saying there is I have nothing that does not come from God. You too. We're the same way. But the difference is we have, we have not, he has nothing else. He has no longer a body. He no longer needs food. He's no longer in the state of need. He's no longer in the state of lack. This leaves me in a state of true holiness, which is only a potential in you. No man cometh before the Father, but by me, is among the most misunderstood statements in the Bible. It does not mean that I am in any way separate or different from you, except in time. Now we know that time does not exist. Actually, the statement is much more meaningful if it is considered on a vertical rather than a horizontal axis. Regarded along the vertical, man stands below me and I stand below God. In the process of rising up, I am higher. This is because without me, the distance between God and man is too great for man to encompass. I bridge the distance as an elder brother to man on one hand and as a son of God on the other. My devotion to my brothers has placed me in charge of the sonship where I can render completely only to the extent that I can share it. Now, this stuff just blows me away because he keeps on getting back to, uh, to the equality of ourselves in nature as God created us and our ability to be exactly like he is even though we may not look and do exactly what he did. So we don't have to, in a sense, do what Jesus did, but we can be Christ-like in the same way that he was Christ-like by learning 
what that means for us individually through him and allowing us to do what we need to do, not what he did, thinking that by the replication or, or the duplication of what he did, we've learned something because that's not the purpose. The purpose isn't to replicate what he did. The purpose is to learn who we are through his understanding of who he is and who we are. And, you know, the whole thing, he says, protect what you value by the act of giving it away. And that's what he's saying here. You know, I have to share this to keep it. And you'll have to share it to keep it as well. You'll have to give this away and allow your brother to be just like you and learn what you've learned in order for you to protect what you value in the learning of it from me. And that's where the chain, that's where our, our, the chain of connection, the chain of um, brotherhood or the, chain, the interlock or the atonement as being an interlocking chain of miracles, let's say. So this appears to contradict another statement, I and my father are one. It doesn't. There are still separate parts in the statement in recognition of the fact that the father is greater. Actually, the original statement was, are of one kind. The Holy Spirit is the bringer of revelations, not miracles. Revelations are indirectly inspired by me because I am close to the Holy Spirit and alert to the revelation readiness in my brothers. I can thus bring down to them more than they can draw down to themselves. Um, what time are we going to go to? Anybody have any idea? Should Whenever I read you through? What's that? Whenever you feel complete. Um, let me see. Let me just read a little bit more. Gene Dixon's description is perhaps a better statement of my position because my feet are on the ground and my hands are in heaven. I can bring down the glories of heaven to my brothers on earth. The Holy Spirit is the highest communication medium. Miracles do not involve this type of communication because they are temporary communicative devices. When man can return to his original form of communication with God by direct revelation, the need for miracles is over. The Holy Spirit mediates higher to lower order communication, keeping the direct channel from God to man open for revelation. Revelation is not reciprocal. It is always from God to man. This is because God and man are not equal. The miracle is reciprocal because it always evolves equality. In the longitudinal or horizontal plane, the true equality of all men in the sonship appears to involve almost endless time. But we know that time is only an artifact introduced as a learning aid. The miracle is a learning device which lessens the need for time. This is what I've been talking about. The sudden shift from the horizontal to vertical perception, which the miracle entails, introduces an interval from which the doer and receiver both emerge much farther along in time than they would otherwise have been. Miracles, a miracle has the unique property of abolishing time by rendering the space of time it occupies unnecessary. There is no relationship, there is no relation between the time a miracle takes and the time it covers. Because a miracle only takes an instant 
but it could shorten time by a thousand years. It could bring your, it could advance your learning much quicker than learning in time in a linear fashion. It substitutes for learning that might have taken thousands of years. It does this by the underlying recognition of perfect equality and holiness between doer and receiver on which the miracle rests. It is unstable, but perfectly consistent. It does not occur predictably across time, and it rarely occurs in comparable forms. But within itself, it is perfectly consistent since it contains nothing but an acknowledgement of equality and worth. All parts are equal. This establishes the prerequisite for validity. We said before, the miracle abolishes time. It does this by a process of collapsing it. It thus abolishes certain intervals within it. It does this, however, within the larger temporal sequence. The validity of the miracle then is predictive, not logical. That's good to know within the temporal schema. It establishes an out of pattern time interval, which is not under the law, usual laws of time. Only in this sense is it timeless. By collapsing time, it literally saves time much the way daylight savings time does. It rearranges the distribution of light. Now that's incredible, the way he uses that understanding. The miracle is the only device which man has at his immediate disposal, disposal for controlling time. Only the revelation transcends it, having nothing to do with time at all. The miracle is much like the body in that both learning aids, which aim at facilitating a state in which they are, both learning aid, aids, which aim at facilitating a state in which they are unnecessary. When a soul is finally in the original state of direct communication, neither the body nor the miracle serves any purpose. While he is in a body, however, man can choose between loveless and miraculous channels of creativity. He can create an empty shell, but he does not create nothing at all. He can wait, delay, paralyze himself, reduce his creativity to almost nothing, and even introduce a real developmental arrest or regression, but he cannot abolish his creativity because being eternal, being created eternal and being eternally created as the father, that's an impossibility because there's no such thing as death. Once you're eternal and infinite, you remain that even if you refuse to recognize by by confusing yourself with space and time, that it's not so. He was not created by his own free will. Only what he creates is his to decide. The basic distinction, the basic decision of the miracle-minded is not to wait on time any longer than necessary. Time can waste as well as be wasted that's one, of those, that's one of those things where, where he's trying to give you both sides of the equation so you understand perfectly well. You know, he's saying what it is and what it isn't. Time can waste as well as be wasted. The miracle worker therefore accepts the time control factor of the miracle gladly because he knows that every collapse of time brings all men closer the ultimate release from time in which the father and son are one. The real meaning of are of one kind is of one mind or will. When the will of the sonship and the father are one, 
their perfect accord is heaven. And I think I'll stop there.